Throughout this panel, Fania, Christina, Brenda, and Estelle are going to underscore the potential of a restorative approach for building just and inclusive communities within schools and the potential for the restorative processes that are embedded in those schools to educate and further the work of justice and reconciliation in our communities beyond the walls of the schoolhouse and the campus. This past Saturday, I had the pleasure of listening to Tony Smith address a gathering at the Black Cultural Center in Cherry Brook. Tony's the co-chair of the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children Inquiry, and he shared that it took time for many, if not all, of the participants of the restorative inquiry to settle into the process, to understand it, to trust it. Many were initially fearful of the process. But, Tony shared, once the participants of the inquiry came to understand the restorative values embedded in the process, they became more comfortable with the idea of a restorative inquiry. And so while it's great, uh, obviously, that people came around and were able to commit to the restorative inquiry, it would have been even better if that hurdle were not there at all. The notion of a restorative approach to reconciliation, to justice, in education and learning remains largely misunderstood by many. What is all this restorative stuff you do anyway? A colleague of mine once asked. <laughs> and I'm going to hazard a guess that many of you here get that same question every now and then. Taking a restorative approach in education in our learning communities from our primary schools to post-secondary institutions has the potential to dissolve that hurdle that Tony described last Saturday. After all, schools transmit values all the time, for better or for worse, and transmit those values to our learners. Why not transmit restorative values to the learners in our schools? Let me give you an example, a safe, concrete example of the transmission of uh, values. It's, a, it's, a, it's an easy example, everyone gets it. Recycling. Today's school-aged children know in what waste stream to place the plastic container with the number two stamped on the bottom. Raise your hand if you know which waste stream number two goes in, anybody? Yeah, that's what I thought. Our, our children are going to know that when they're adults as well. We've taught them that in school, but not as part of a discrete recycling lesson plan or a discrete recycling training session, but because it's part of their day-to-day. -day. It just wouldn't occur to them to put the container in the wrong waste stream or not to recycle it. That's just not how it's done. And they'll demand that the older people in their lives do the same thing. Trust me, it's true. <laughs> Try sneaking an empty sour cream container into the garbage in a house where a 12-year-old lives. <laughs> so if we can pay attention to environmental issues in our learning communities and shift expectations and practices accordingly, we can also pay attention to the ways in which relationships are structured in our learning communities and shift expectations and practices accordingly. A sort of approach changes the culture in learning communities, and as you know, a change in culture reflects a change in values. And those values are carried by our learners into our communities that surround our schools. And when those same learners become policymakers, or when they encounter or rub up against the systems that impact their lives, they will both seek and demand the values that are reflected in the system, the values that they carry, they'll seek and demand that they're reflected in those very same systems that are meant to support them including practices and policies around reconciliation and justice. It will become the way we do business in our communities. Individual behavior, then, is not a goal or the target of a restorative approach. And as you're going to hear shortly from our panelists, the potential of a restorative approach in learning in communities and schools on university campuses is best realized when it is not used as a set of tools for responding to in discipline only but as a way of developing people's notions, expectations, and capacities for citizenship, when it's used as a way of exploring on the day-to-day -day what it means to belong. So this panel's gonna invite you to consider the broader potential of restorative approach in learning communities to bring about fundamental change in our communities. We'll be starting with Fania, who's going to share her thoughts and her work in schools 
with restorative justice and how restorative justice can bring about social change and move us toward racial equity. But she'll remind us that we need to be thoughtful and keep our eye on the prize, racial equity, because it's easy to reduce suspensions without getting at or reducing racial inequity. Christine is going to discuss a restorative approach to curriculum and pedagogy and how, when developed through a relational lens, curriculum can better realize the potential of a restorative approach to support and develop citizenship and democratic values in our learning communities. Brenda will reflect on the role that post-secondary educational communities play in creating systemic change. And we'll wrap up with Estelle, who will touch on restorative leadership, building community, the impact of a restorative approach on students, and how restorative learning communities can become central to community well-being. And now I'll invite Connie to come up.